Good morning. I'd like to call to order uh, the April 8th uh, Oregon Education Investment Board Best Practices and Student Transition Subcommittee. Um, uh, should we do roll call? Okay. Yvonne Curtis. Present. Mark Mulvihill. Here. David Reeves. Here. Lynn Saxton. She's on the phone. Kate Turan. I'm on the phone. Thank you. Um, Kate Turan. Kim Williams. All right, thank you. Um, I'm looking for a motion for approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. And since there's nobody else to oppose, we'll move forward. <laughs> okay. We have approval of the agenda. I'm looking for a motion to approve the minutes. Second. I, I, I yes. ask you to approve or second. Great. Thank you, Lynn. We have a, a motion and a second. Anyone opposed to moving forward with approving the minutes? No opposition, so we move forward on that one. We're going to begin the meeting today with follow-up from our last meeting, College and Career Readiness Definition Edit. Hilda? Uh, yes, yeah, so I wanted to uh, let you know that based on the um, uh, approval of the subcommittee to consider the one word addition to the college and career readiness definition, um, that was also approved by the college and career readiness cross sector planning group, it will be on the agenda um, and um, Chair Curtis will be bringing that forward with a friendly amendment of the one word uh, to be added to that definition. And just if you recall, the word was ready, readiness, or resourcefulness, rather, as one of the indicators. And that was the recommendation from the Youth Development Council. So, so, we are so we're bringing that forward to bringing this Bringing it forward to OEIB. the um, OEIB. Everybody already um, addressed it within the sub -order. It's time to put a fork in that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So um, okay. Hilda had already also sent out a draft template for um, that we would use to guide us in all the feedback that we've been given and in pri prioritizing <coughs> our recommendations that we'll send forward. She did not receive feedback, but we have since revised that form. We'll use it today in our group conversation, and uh, she'll add other information to that as we move our recommendations forward to OEIB. Mm -hmm. In terms of the re-imaging grades 9 to 14, um, given that spring break and all the work with community college and ALD, which is with the accelerated ALD. learning committee. Thank you. Um, it seemed premature to dig deeper into the area of 914. We do have some recommendations. They will be part of the conversation today. Um, so we may want more information or other people to come forward, but we can determine that today if we need that. So let's move to 5.0 on the agenda, which are, is our two-minute update from each of the uh, bodies. And I'm going to add to that, Mark's going to give an update on Spanish proficiency. So we'll start with, uh, Lynn, are you in a place where you can do that? I can in about 10 minutes. So if we go with Mark, I'll probably, I'm pulling up now, so I should be in my office and can get my remarks in front of me and be good to go. Okay, sounds great. And if we have to move on to a new agenda item, we'll come back and catch you up in a minute. So let's start with David. Okay. The HEC, well, our last meeting was a joint meeting with the HEC, but since then the student achievement and funding subcommittee have met we uh, had just received letters from all the community college presidents and university presidents uh, at that meeting that morning, so we didn't really have time to go through all of them. Uh, had requested that they provide us some input, input on their budget, their own budget priorities, and um, what they saw is moving us towards 40-40-20 to help inform us on the heck as we uh, set budget priorities at the state level. So we had a lot of presentations from uh, presidents and their representatives that day. Uh, also looking at some things with capital construction. We're not really looking at individual allocation to institution, but uh, policies we can set with the budget to help us get to 40-40-20. Some of the concerns certainly are current service level, looking at that or looking at uh, new more innovative ways maybe and not repeating the current service level, that's still a question. 
and obviously being sensitive to tuition increases and how the budget uh, affects tuition increases. The universities um, still trying to look for some similarities there among them. Like I said, we had just gotten the letters that day. The community colleges, the presidents had come together to set some common priorities and among those were if if the heck were to do uh, look at budget priorities those would be areas like developmental education equity and career and technical education all so, kind of go together <laughs> well and, and all three actually fit in with the priorities of the heck and I would also say the OEIB uh, that I thought was uh, it was really reassuring they were looking at the same areas. So we will continue on that achievement and funding committee to look at those recommendations as we come for recommendations to the HEC on budget priorities. Does that include um, conversation about assessments? Like no, that's a different, okay. there's, a, there's a different committee that's looking uh, at that. We'll be looking at achievement compacts, but there's another committee that's working on assessments. I forget its name right off. That's okay. I was just curious where that landed. Any other comments, questions about that for David? Okay. Thank you, David. Sure. Mark, Spanish proficiency. Um, I had a chance to uh, share with Hilda and Nancy and some others uh, a project that I'm really, really excited about that we've incorporated in the Eastern that I think has a real potential to be an early win for the equity lens. Uh, we've developed a Spanish proficiency assessment for the 100 level series. And looking at students in particular, David's going to like this, um, looking in particular at our, our, our Latino students' language as, a, as credit for prior learning, looking at it as a strength rather than a weakness. And to be, you know, just pragmatic, we have all, a lot of these students coming in that have a mastery of their native language. They should be earning college credit for that, just like any other credit for prior learning. So we've developed this assessment, and we've started rolling it out this fall. It was normed by 25 foreign language teachers. Uh, foreign language teachers all the way from Huntington to Forest Grove sat in a room with college adjuncts, uh, college faculty, and developed the 101, 102, and 103 level series. And this proficiency assessment, um, I mean, they have really laser focused it down to the grammar, what they need to see, um, where the teachers score the work. They do that through video, where kids are taped in the classroom and they're speaking component with one another. Um, there's a reading com or a writing component as well, and it's the same assessment that's being used in the Spanish 3 Eastern Promise. The Spanish 3 is the high school levels, the 100 level series. So this is our first shot where we actually have a proficiency and we're awarding college credit in the class and outside the class for native speakers. So I got a couple numbers for you here right away. Uh, these are our first shot at it, numbers that we just have from this winter. Talk about the Spanish proficiency. Okay, 88% of the native speakers passed all 12 of the 100 level Spanish credits. 87% of the native speakers earned an A on 101, 70% earned an A on 102, 28% of the English speakers earned an A on 102. So, what we're seeing quite obviously, is our kids have command of the language, that puts them ahead of the game. We were talking junior, seniors earning 12 credits for their mastery, and this assessment, they've got it after all the norming and storming that they've done all fall, they've got this thing down to a science where it's a quick administration, and uh, it's really, really exciting to see um, how this is going to change the games for, for our kids. To me, it's our first tangible uh, equity lens issue. It's very, very scalable. And this assessment isn't just for Spanish. It can be used for any foreign language. So 
we're pretty excited about it. The colleges are pretty excited about it. We're working through it. Um, you know, the bugs, typical of any bugs. How many credits does Forest Grove earn? I'm happy to say between October and January, Forest Grove students earn 600 credits. Wow. Without taking any more courses, just taking the class. What that does for students who may be struggling in content in English, for them to be able to say, I've got 12 college credits already, really changes the game in terms of confidence, identity, potential trajectory for my career, and so on. Very, very exciting. So we're very grateful to Forest Grove, to, to uh, Eastern Promise that they've allowed Forest Grove to grasp onto that because it's extremely important for our students. And another great way that we're doing uh, kind of that collective impact and not looking at regions as a boundary. What's really cool too is we've got the 100 series knocked out. Now we start with the 200 series. That's 24 credits. That's halfway to a minor in Spanish. And the 200 level series, what my, my dream is, is that our ELL teachers can provide the writing support to these students. Because what we're finding, they have the speaking ability to get through all the 100 and to get through quite a bit of the 200, but then they hit that wall on the writing component. And what a natural thing if we could tie that into some of our ELL work at our high schools and middle schools. Great. Exciting. Very exciting. Thank you, Mark, for sharing that. Uh, I just, yes, uh, David. Just two questions. Uh, who's, who's doing the scoring on the test? Is it the high school teachers or the college teachers? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's a combination? All, all, yes. All, all of the... It has to be approved by the college. So the college has been from day one. Our ad, most of our high school teachers are adjuncts. You know, there's just so many. They work, they work for Blue Mountain, Treasure Valley, whoever. Mm -hmm. But we have our university staff as well. And, you know, it's the fur fly. It's been funny to watch it. The fur definitely flies in that room. I mean, those guys go at each other. On, we got to have this. we got to have that. And what we're finding, Dave, is that assessment is more rigorous than what the kids are actually taking once they're in college. Mm -hmm. And are you saying Eastern Oregon University is recognizing these? As is Blue Mountain. Credits, okay. And is uh, Forest Grove, is there a college or university recognizing those? Eastern Oregon. Okay. okay, gotcha. Okay. So the idea is to bring this statewide then? Exactly. I, I mean, as we talk about the Eastern Promise scale up, I think this, this idea of the equity lens for our Latino kids in particular can be a game changer that we should scale. Yeah, and David, that's kind of a that's one of the conversations with accelerated learning committee is just how do we accelerate so we can get more college credits in high school. And I'm just gonna call out that I'm appreciative that we were willing able to work through the barrier that has been around region to at least do a pilot so that we could see what could you partner on even way across the state and what can be scalable and what can be uh, duplicated in another place, right? Well, the video conference can report you. Know, we, we have that capability if we really use it to break down those break down those barriers. And I know last year we were talking a lot about the idea of regional collective impacts, but I don't even know why we need to have the term region there if we could get some of the barriers out around the region and have uh, colleges specialize in areas that they really want to work and help develop this kind of opportunity for kids. You know, maybe different areas develop something else that we can scale and learn across the state. So anyway, thank you. Very exciting. Lynn, are you with us now? I am, and okay. I'm ready to go. Thank you for your patience. Sure. Um, so there's a lot going on with the Early Learning Council, and I'll just start off by saying this, uh, I think, it is tomorrow, actually, that a subcommittee of the ELC is reviewing the um, early, liter early literacy grant applications. So we'll get that done tomorrow, and then we will be approving those during our April 16th, 7.30 a.m. conference call meeting. So we're excited about getting that up and running. Um, we have focused on, uh, at our last meeting, the importance of having a, you know, a plan and a scorecard. And so we're working with um, uh, two 
consultants from Washington State who have a lot of early learning experience and experience in benchmarking both through um, the public sector but the private uh, foundation sector as well. So we're excited to get that work up and going and have that as our tool starting in May. Um, a joint Department of Ed and Early Learning Division team went to North Carolina at the end of the month, last month, to meet with eight other states around the kindergarten and third grade assessment, which was helpful. Again, uh, we continue to be excited about that tool being in place, and obviously we'll continue to refine and improve it, but are pleased to have it, have it launched. Um, the hub request went live for applications on April Fool's Day, <laughs> which I always love. Yeah, that was a little and ironic there, on May 8th. So we will have, we'll be working with the next round of hublets being formed. And um, we're kind of, we, you know, we go around the state, we talk to people, do workshops about how to do this and what the key criteria are. So that's underway. We've been to the Storage. We've been to Eastern Oregon and the coast, so we're pretty well covered there. I think we we get to Eastern Oregon this yeah this Friday, and then finally our next Joint Early Learning Council State Board of Education meeting is on May 22nd in Pendleton. So um, we have that on our schedule. I think. Overall, we feel like we're, we're continuing to make solid progress. Um, some things are moving faster than expected, some things are moving slower, but overall our deliverables are on track um, and, uh, and we're, I think we have good momentum and we're seeing good work in the field. Great, thank you. Lynn, I have a question about the assessments. Is, is uh, having those assessments available in Spanish a part of the conversation? Yes. In fact, there's a there's a very much a part of the conversation, and there was a discussion around um, what there's a tool for doing that. I think uh, so. Yes, I don't have. I'll see in May the where it fits into the work plan. But yes, that's part of the discussion. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, Lynn, I've got. A, I'm just kind of curious in working with our hub and, and getting things moving. It's very clear that the prenatal to two is going to be dominated by health. And as I look at the three sectors in our hub, health, safety, and education, those early formative years, it's all about birth weight, it's all about oral health, immunizations, etc. We have really clearly defined state outcomes in education. We have, you know, targets for the KRA, we have targets for the third grade reading and growth numbers on there. And it was really easy to set, set the hub education benchmarks because they're already done by OEIB. Has there been any conversation by the CCOs and DHS to have the same measurable state outcomes for those other two sectors in the hub? Yes, I, would, I appreciate you asking that question. So two things. Number one, the kindergarten readiness assessment has been adopted by the Oregon Health Authority and as a result of CCOs as one of their benchmarks and criteria. So that's, that's probably the first crossover metric between the systems of care and that's exciting. Um, the other thing that I just want to touch on going back to your hub having three areas, you know, one of the things that we adopted four years ago for the hub were five domains for screening. And some of the hubs, I think, have, have collapsed those areas, but, but we're going to hold to assessments and clear metrics for each of the five areas. And um, part of what keeps happening is there's, there's such a volume of stuff going on that, that we need to keep bringing people back to the forest for the trees kind of approach. Those five domains are maternal health, family risk, general developmental, physical health, and behavioral psychosocial. So as we move forward, I think one of our challenges is to, we're going to have crisp measurements in those areas. There's, and the challenge is going to be to keep holding people to the domains, because those are our screening domains, whether they're hubs or individual providers, et cetera. 
So we're going to need to do that. But we're also going to need to, in each of those five domains, you know, when we started this work four years ago, one of the first things we noticed is we could be discussing for the next 10 years which metrics to use in what domains. And we're pretty focused on keeping the metrics in each of those domains clear, agreed to, and measurable. Um, one of the areas, for example, that is really critical that we know is this discussion around, um, you know, the, the, the testing for autism, for example, has advanced light years in the last three years. Um, testing prior to two is critical. Um, uh, appropriate developmental interventions, as soon as it's identified, can change the trajectory for an autistic child entering kindergarten and first grade. So we don't have that all buttoned up yet, but, but there is a clear expectation that we will, for each hub, again, we have these five screening domains, and that we will look at the hub's template for analysis, assessment, and deployment, if you will, of the services to ensure that they're touching all the bases. Uh, one of the reasons it's important to touch all the bases is, um, and I'll just to put this in a strength-based way, it's, it's possible that you could do the early learning piece and the kids would uh, be healthy and they would be, um, they would be in healthy uh, families um, and they'd have good emotional relationships and development, but they would still not be ready to learn for a variety of reasons, perhaps um, language barriers, perhaps other barriers. So part of what we're pretty intent on, and, and we will take all the criticism, suggestions, et cetera, that we can get, is that we need to main the, maintain the focus on the interplay of the five domains to drive to a readiness position for school. That, that frankly, um, if you got all the other indicators right, the kids were arriving in kindergarten without sufficient preparation for school, we have not done our job. Um, and families have not done their job, and providers have not done their job. So we're going to be keeping a pretty sharp focus on being able to, that, that hubs get to put all these various things together, but they really need to drive cumulatively to that outcome. And, and I, I'd agree with that. Of course, Lenny, I mean, you're spot on. Here's from the field and actually trying to implement the hub is a major, major project of bringing together very diverse groups. And the more goals that each one of us have in our own silos, the less relevance that has for the hub. And somehow driving down, if it's going to be those five domains, and we, like I said, I, I, we compressed it into three, we just need a the fewer metrics that we can agree on, it's like the Regional Achievement Collaborative. Same thing, because the hub is one of many, the RAC, Regional Solutions, all these things that are going on. The more we can comp put together the same metrics that this is what the hub does, you do your own pro your own metric in EIE, CSE, Head Start, whatever, but the hub, it's all about this. And we've done that really well with OEIB, with third grade reading, for instance, and the KRS. So anyway, just some feedback. Thank you. For I, I think it's helpful. I think the thing, and this may not be clear, and this is a good, maybe a good thing for us to talk about in more detail as the hubs emerge, is one of the things that we have found is that in some settings, it's perceived that the hub is a player at the table, essentially almost like another provider. And what, what we're, the original intent and design of the hub is in fact, the, one of the visions that we had is a hub that really basically has um, a data person, a, a financial ops person, and an administrator, and that's all you need. Because the hub is to orchestrate the diverse efforts into a cumulative impact. And part of what had, was a struggle in the first round of the hub applications was essentially it was we formed a hub, and what it is is we brought all these players to the table, and they're all going to do what they've always done, and it's going to be great. 
but it's not going to be integrated to a result or a common set of indicators. So I think I'm totally in agreement with you that it has to be a common set of indicators. The change piece here is the hubs are accountable and responsible for taking the, the miscellany services available in the hub and driving to a result. And that's different than just being a provider at the table. Great. Thank you, Lynn, so much. Thanks for the conversation. I just want to add a thank you for putting together the teams that are going around and assessing with the hub development. I think that's going to go a long way to help us be consistent across the state and not everybody inventing their own thing. So thank you for that. Okay. We're going to move on to 6.0 on our agenda, which is development and developmental education practice participation rates and outcomes of Oregon Public Health graduates at Oregon Community Colleges. So Michelle Hodera, Research Analyst from uh, Regional Education Lab at Education Northwest and Elizabeth Cox Brand, Research and Communication Director with Oregon Department of Community Colleges and Workforce Development. We have had the slides for a while. Thank you. Uh, I know we had to ask you to come back to this meeting from last and I apologize for that but appreciate you coming back and rather than going through the slides what we were hoping you could do is give us a very quick kind of three minute what would you have us focus on and I'd like to uh, take our committee back to the packet that was in last month we didn't really send it to you but you still have that packet if you would um, hopefully you've already earmarked some places uh, that we can have discussion about. We hope to focus on discussion and with you. So if there are some things you want to discuss and want to call out, that's what I'd ask you to focus on right now. Okay. All right. Okay. So I'll begin. I'm Michelle Hodera. Thank you for having me um, to talk about developmental education. And um, so I think one thing I would just want to start with is um, so this slide um, talks about the data sources we have. I just want to provide some context on who community college students in Oregon are before we get into the findings because we, have, we don't have data from the Oregon four years, but we do have data from the National Student Clearinghouse, so we know where Oregon high school graduates are going to college. And what we've seen is that compared to Oregon students who start college at the start their post-secondary career at a four-year college, um, Oregon students who attend a community college at some point after high school are different. Higher proportions um, uh, had free or reduced price lunch status in high school. Higher proportions are students of color. Higher proportions went to high schools with high proportions of free or reduced price lunch students in Oregon. And so I think this is important context and this will be in the, in the study. The study this is going to be a study report that comes out and I'll give it to Hilda so she can give it to you all when it comes out. But this is an important context because it helps us think about not only supporting Oregon students, but how to support Oregon community colleges who educate um, a disproportionate numbers of traditionally disadvantaged students. Um, low income students, students who are going to college, first generation students, um, college students. And so um, to begin, you know, we see a lot of um, uh, concentrations of students of color and low income students taking developmental education. I think a lot of that can be explained by the types of students community colleges educate in the state. Um, and so that's one thing I want to point out. And then, um, so, we can skip to, and this was just, um, he'll ask me a basic question about how many students are taking developmental education. And so this is just um, the number of students, yes, go ahead, Mark. What is your definition? So it's just based on course enrollment, and so if you look on the slide notes, I listed the course numbers for which courses are considered developmental education. Below 100? Yes, below 100 except for writing 115. 115 is considered developmental. Because it's non-transfer level. It doesn't transfer to the four years, and it prepares students for um, 121, the English composition course. Is that the highest developmental class in writing 115? Yes. Yeah. And so there's, um, you know, we found 66% of Oregon high school graduates who attended a community college at some point in time in the data we have took at least one developmental education course. Um, and 
64% were concentrated in a very small number of courses, and so those are listed in the slide notes. Um, and then this looks at the breakdown by subject, and so you can see that participation in math is much higher than English, so you'd have to add the um, green and the purple bar to get the total number of, total proportion of students from each graduating class participating in math, and then you'd add the green and the light blue bar to get the total in reading or writing. Um, and so you can see that, you know, math, um, uh, math underpreparedness or, or math uh, academic challenges are, are m more of an issue for Oregon high school graduates than challenges in reading and writing. So are there any questions about this? Okay. It's fascinating that 67%, that's also our, basically our third grade reading benchmark, statewide average and our graduation rate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and we also, the, uh, you can map on um, the, the increase in Pell recipients um, attending Oregon Community Colleges, and it maps perfectly to this. There's been a, there's been a steady increase. Um, it jumped during the, the years of the recession, and it's just been increasing ever since. So there's been a, um, students from low-income backgrounds seem to be choosing a community college um, over no college or, or a four-year in greater numbers over the years, and this maps perfectly to rise in developmental education enrollment. Um, okay, and then um, the study also looks at differences in enrollment by gender, race, ethnicity, and SES indicators, and we can see large gaps, and um, we also use a statistical model to see if we can explain those gaps in enrollment away based on um, background characteristics. And these gaps in enrollment still persist for students who are, are similar across many different observable characteristics, although they might be different by gender, race, or ethnicity. So for example, um, you know, we see some uh, large gaps in enrollment between Latino high school graduates and white student um, high school graduates in developmental education um, at the community colleges. And even, even the students who attended the same high school have the same gender, the same Oak scores. Um, these enrollment um, differences still persist. And so there could be a couple explanations that um, we don't know for sure because we don't have the data, but they raise questions that should be pursued. And one could be difference in high school course taking among students based on gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. So certain students could be taking you know, more math or more challenging math or more challenging um, English in high school that's explaining some of these gaps. Or it could be psychological factors like confidence and, and self-esteem. And so those are, those are things we can't control for in the statistical model um, that may be explaining these, these enrollment um, gaps that exist and that, that are really good questions to keep pursuing and, and answering. Any questions about that? Just an observation, mm -hmm. when uh, Mark was sharing the information about the Spanish profici proficiency for students, it may be of interest for us to try to follow those students who are getting that early boost of confidence around their, their first language and seeing, you know, like you just said, that mm -hmm. could be one of those factors. Just to mm -hmm. um, Okay, so then there's a whole set of slides that look at post-secondary outcomes. And we looked, we used National Student Clearinghouse to track students. Um, and so I'll just show you, let's look at math, for example. So we looked at their post-secondary outcomes by this course they started in. And um, this is their post-secondary outcomes across the country. So we tracked the percentage of students who were still enrolled or had earned a degree each year. And you can see that outcomes decrease um, based on your starting level. So the lower you start in math, the um, lower your post-secondary persistence and degree attainment. So after five years in college, students who started in Math 10, which is a, like an arithmetic class, about 15% of them had earned a certificate and an AA or a BA or were still in college. Um, compared to students who started in college math, which is 105 or above, about 49% had earned a, a credential or were still in college. And um, Elizabeth is going to speak to some of the recommendations that the community colleges are thinking about that will directly address some of these um, problems of high student attrition from 
developmental education and college. Um, and so some of those reforms have to do with accelerating students through these, um, through their developmental requirements. Great. That's what my question was going to be about. So. <laughs> and then I'll just end because um, I, I said I would focus more on the, you know, thinking about what we can do on the high school side. Mm -hmm. And with this slide, which thinks about, you know, how to ideally support students from high school um, as they progress into post-secondary education. And so this is something that a lot of states and programs and are thinking about, including Oregon. And I, I thought about this because I'm a participant on the Smarter Balance Assessment Policy Work Group, and this is kind of the, kind of the framework they are considering that is something that is considered a promising practice. So you provide students in their junior year an early assessment, like the Smarter Balance, that is an indication of their, their college readiness. And then you use that assessment to target senior year course options. So students who are performing very poorly, you want to provide them with um, academic courses that will you know, address those gaps in quantitative literacy and academic literacy. Students who seem to be um, doing pretty well, you want to provide them with accelerated college credit options like dual credit, advanced place, and inter international baccalaureate. Um, and then at the end of the senior year, there may still be students who um, are still struggling academically or, or, um, or are not college ready. And so there's opportunities there to provide them with summer bridge programs to address those gaps. And then ideally, um, even at, when they matriculate and enroll, there's supports and um, you know, services for them as into their first year. And so I think that those are, that's a promising framework that the Smarter Balance Group is looking at and is going on across the country, and so. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning. For the record, Elizabeth Brand, Director of Research and Communications for the Oregon Department of Community Colleges and Workforce Development. And it, it's funny, Michelle and I were sitting back there, and it's like, are we, here we go again. We've been doing this kind of dog and pony show, it seems, all over. And uh, Michelle is actually part of the Developmental Education Redesign Work Group on as is um, Ariel Northwest to help us with looking at data and uh, to bring a little more perspective to the work. Um, so I'm primarily going to focus on a couple of things. One, I'm very glad that Michelle was talking about who community college students are. That seems to be something that get, what gets lost a lot as we're talking about um, post-secondary education. Um, although the universities would say too that their, their college students are changing quite a bit as well. Um, we have a lot of swirling of our students. Um, but our average age is 28 years old. Um, we have students, 84% in the fall, were enrolled part-time. So it just takes a while for our students to get through, and they have a lot of other things going on in their lives. Um, so looking at this, the Developmental Education Redesign Work Group um, was put together last November, and it has teams of four from all community colleges that come to Salem once a month, and we read research, we hear from people from all over the country who are doing exciting, innovative things in developmental education. And then we are going to have recommendations for the state of Oregon for how we can do it differently in Oregon community colleges. Um, Michelle was just mentioning that, it was last Friday, that the math group is actually almost ready to get their recommendations rolled out. Um, as of May 16th, we are having a meeting where we are inviting in reviewers, and Dr. Golden will be giving an invitation to this, um, as well as Ben Cannon, um, our Oregon Community College presidents, um, legislators, um, and others to come in and actually hear what it is that we're recommending. Then CCWD has set aside funding from our strategic fund to support this work going through the next year. So in the 14-15 year is when the recommendations will be rolled out on campus, um, teams will have time to actually work with each other, uh, get professional development, because some of these things that we're talking about are changes in how we teach. Um, we're talking about accelerating the opportunities that students um, have in the developmental education sequence, um, because as you can see, if you're four or five levels below college algebra, your chances of making it are very slim. So when we say accelerating, we don't mean to keep doing what we've been doing only faster. What we mean is that we are making the time that it takes for a student to get to college level shorter. So we are looking at various models, um, reducing the exit points. 
Because as you look at who our students are, the more opportunities that they have as an exit point, the more opportunities we have to lose them, the more opportunities for life to get in the way, just to be completely honest. So there are recommendations that will be coming out for mathematics, for reading, for writing, and for student services, student supports. Um, because as Michelle had mentioned, that's a critical piece um, that is needed. And so we need to figure out how we can better assist these students in getting through their, their programs and getting to their goals. Um, so we are excited about it, um, and the college presidents are way behind this. Um, obviously in our letter that went to the heck as far as our budget priorities, developmental education is right up at the top because we need to make sure that these students are getting through. Um, one thing that Michelle and I have talked about is um, one focus that I would like this committee to keep, keep in mind is uh, the other end of the 20. Um, most of our students are not directly from high school. Um, there's there's a, a lot of numbers that are coming in, but in general, when we take all of our enrollments, only about 10% are straight from high school, which means they enroll directly after their um, graduation from high school. Uh, so we've got a lot of folks who are coming at us from a lot of different walks of life. Um, I know that there's conversations going on. I'm scheduled to meet with the Smarter Balance group um, as we're talking about using that assessment for college placement, and, and that's very important work. Um, but part of the work that we're doing um, in the redesign is we've got a lot of students um, that won't be impacted by that, that we still need to serve. So we are also focused on our older students and what we need to be doing for them in the current time while we're waiting for the class of 2025 to come up through the line. So I, I don't know what, any questions. I mean, well, I was thinking about uh, what we could do for high school, and absolutely early assessment is key. Um, I like to joke that there's only two majors in the world. There's math majors and non-math majors. And I would be a non-math major. And had I not had um, college algebra, even in my junior year of high school, I don't know how I would have possibly gotten through it in college. Um, having a couple of years gap for mathematics is just uh, a killer for a lot of our students. Um, one other thing that I would like to add to this, um, one thing that's going on that's kind of on the side but associated with the developmental ed redesign is we're working with the Joint Board's Articulation Committee to bring forward recommendations as far as um, an alternative pathway through mathematics that doesn't have to go through college algebra. Currently, everybody's got to go through college algebra, and that creates quite a bottleneck. Um, we're looking at what about all of the non-STEM majors um, that don't necessarily need college algebra. Um, we're looking at statistics and how that may be another pathway. And there are many models out there that we've been examining in the work group um, to look at this. Uh, so we're looking at all kinds of different ways that we can help our students be successful and to get through these pipelines. Great. I have some questions. I think Mark does go ahead and go first. Okay. I feel like I've been teased today. And I know this isn't the day, but I just I'm excited to hear the amount of energy going forth on this subject. It's thrilling to hear you're going through the research, whatnot. One thing that I just keep thinking about, you know, as I think of developmental ed and I think of what's being taught and how's it being assessed, simplified. So really what is math ninety-five compared to algebra two in high school? Right. And now that we're moving to the Common Core, like a lot of work Kentucky's done, mm -hmm. have you brought in K-12 folks on this alignment piece to Blur 11 or 14 with this work? Not yet. Not yet. We are currently working with our university partners because we're looking at the, the progression right. through the model right. and up on into, especially with this new statistics-based pathway or a quantitative reasoning pathway, because we need to ensure that it's going to transfer yeah. once and our I, students And I there. get, you know, you know, Rome's not built in a day, and, and it's right. wonderful what you're doing, but I, I think a, net, a natural evolutionary stage pretty quickly is let's really drive down to that freshman year, mm -hmm. which you're doing with Smarter Balance. Mm -hmm. And the Common Core is our launch pad. I, I, it troubles me that I don't hear enough Common Core alignment between in 11 to 14. We're still siloed on those. And if you drive that down, here's our math series from Oregon freshmen. It gets you to this point. Mm -hmm. So you're not in math 95, you're freshman year. Right. And we have that conversation again. I'm going to begin working with the Smarter Balance group because the, things are running in 
kind of parallel tracks at the moment, but we have some crossover and some conversation, and it's part of everybody is excited about this work, and we do want to have a lot of success with it. Um, so we are looking at how we can drive down, but yeah, Rome wasn't built in a day. So we're tackling this dragon first, and then we're at, uh, this work isn't far from done. Far from done. There's a lot yet to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned an event where you're inviting participants to mm -hmm. come and give feedback. Are you inviting high school principals uh, into that? We haven't gotten the invitations out yet. I hadn't even thought about it, so we'd be glad to. Well, I was just thinking that might be a first step of having uh, our principals start to have a peek into the fact that the work is being done. I think that's something that we should be celebrating and communicating statewide. Um, so we don't stay siloed. Mm -hmm. It might be a first step to say that how might we integrate that? Just a suggestion. Right. Look at the list up there. There's still a mystery at the high school level. What the heck? 95 is 75, 65, and then how does that go into my names? My sequence right. of algebra one, two, yeah. three, mm -hmm. geometry. Mm -hmm. But you know, Hilda, one of the things that you're trying to call are these nine million 11 to 14 initiatives going on mm -hmm. in the state. I'm trying to get that together. To me, this is one that we already have K-12 people all over this, 11 to 14 learning. When you're ready, that's the natural stage to bring them to the table in the high school series. Because right now the high school, they're so focused on 24 credit diploma getting through essential skills that they don't see the forest through the trees that we're moving, we may be doing that and the kids are going into Math 95. Mm -hmm. And they ain't finishing. Right. That was one of the things that um, Hilda had asked me to think about what we could do to help address this need for students that are graduating from high school and going into the developmental education. And one of the things that I had written down was curriculum and outcomes alignment. Um, the work that we're doing with the Dev Ed Redesign is faculty driven. These teams are made up of faculty members primarily from developmental education, um, mathematics, reading, writing, um, and we have representation from instructional administrators as well, but it's faculty that need to do this work. And so we need to get the faculties together um, for these different groups. Um, the, the work that this group is doing is exciting. It's a huge lift. But the thing that has been the luxury of this is taking time to actually look at the research, talk about the research, chew on it, say what doesn't work, why this would work in Oregon, why it wouldn't work in Oregon, listening to people who have actually done it taking time to do this before we just jump into whatever is next and see if it works. Um, we're committed to making this happen purposefully and intentionally so that it will, um, it's t rolling in with achieving the dream efforts that we've got going on in 10 of our 17 colleges. Um, there's work going on all over Oregon, which is fantastic, but we need to get this to a higher level. And one thing we did on Friday is we looked at um, Green River Community College in Washington has crosswalks. So between their high schools and college course curriculum. So it says, you know, if you got an A in this high school math class, this means that you are ready for this community college, Green River Community College math course. If you got a B, if you got a C, if you got a D. If you got a D, you have to take the placement exam. But So we looked at those crosswalks between um, English and math um, from Washington, and it really piqued, you know, the faculty, um, community college faculty um, members' interest um, about you know, try, trying to take that model down to Oregon. So that's that's one kind of practice we could look at. I, I neglected to say that, that they are going to have recommendations for placement mm -hmm. as well. And there's actually a group that's looking to continue this work um, talking about common placement tests, common cuts. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> there's the teaser. Which yeah. is exciting. It's exciting because it's their work. Yeah. So, so that's another with a reason. Common benchmark. Another reason why involving high school principals, right now so many of us have been trying to work on collective impact 11 to 14 years because there's so many initiatives and opportunities going on and people feeling like there's a huge barrier and they're bumping up against that and I get that part of that is there's all these other efforts going on and you can only stretch people so thin. That's why I think it's really important to start begin uh, inviting the K-12, specifically high school principals in because the perception needs to change before you're going to go work on the work with groups of people so that there's a, a willingness to do that. I wanted to throw out two other things and you don't have to respond to them, they're just things I'd like to make sure are being thought of. One of them, you mentioned, so specifically the idea of outcomes, I'm assuming that these recommendations are going to come with identifications of what outcomes do we hope for. I'm just remembering a way early conversation 
about, well, it's hard when we look at who is the population in community college. Some of those things are people wanting to take courses for this and that. So I don't, I don't know how you wrap your arms around that, but it seems to be that there ought to be a way in each of the recommendations to recommend an outcome that we would be looking at. So I'm assuming that that's part of the conversation? Yes, they, these aren't just going to be broad strokes. They're actually going to be something that's actionable. Great. And the other one I wanted to throw out with that is the conversation around proficiency. Mm -hmm. So along with Common Core State Standards and where we're going with proficiency, that's another area where we continue to bump up against. And I know it's a philosophical difference, and I agree, it has to involve faculty. But a lot of work has been done in the K-12 to get faculty to understand the benefits and the need for proficiency. Um, I just hope that work's going on across so that we can align those things. Yeah, there's a, a credit for prior learning work group that's doing a lot of this type of effort um, in non-proficiency, and I was having that conversation this morning with a bunch of community college chairs regarding proficiencies, particularly as they apply to our student veterans. So there is a lot of work going on in, in higher ed Good. regarding proficiency. Thank you. Hilda. So, Elon? Yes? Go ahead, Lynn. Quick question, what is the expectation of math in the Common Core Standards of math completed in high school? What's the level that is now the norm for math completion in high school? Mark, you want to answer Can you repeat your question, Lynn? So, I mean, this is probably a really, shows my age more than anything. In, back in the day, there was an expectation that most students would complete some level of calculus in high school prior to community college or college. What is that expectation in the Common Core standards? Is it that you can, what what are we expecting most students to complete well, our, at the high school? Our grad our our high school diploma is three years of math with no uh, the, the standard is it cannot be lower than algebra one to graduate. Okay, that's where we currently are as we speak. So with the Common Core, Lynn, we know that, that the standards in the Common Core are going to be more rigorous and different than our current Oregon standards. So I'm trying not to dodge the question. What I'm basically saying is the only requirement in Oregon right now is that three years of math at a minimum at Algebra 1. What is killing our kids and is an equity issue is unless you have parents telling the kid you're going to take AP math, you're going to take pre-calc, you're going to take calc, you're going to have a full senior year. The majority of our kids don't have a full senior year. And so without that rigorous year, and that starts in the junior year as well, then these kids are immediately remediating when they're getting out of high school. That's what our current practice is. Okay, Hilda? And so does the Common Core or the initiatives underway drive that to a different endpoint? Well, I'm just going to jump in here. Uh, I was going to mention that the Smarter Balanced Assessment Group that uh, Michelle uh, referenced, which is involving both school district personnel and community college and four-year institutions, uh, is pressing on this because what we do know is that the depth of math is at a higher level than what was expected before. But I think this is the vehicle that we could maybe use some of the core to college funding to move the discussion with your help, Mark, and maybe some thinking about how we might put um, that meeting together that really brings the folks from the high schools together. Uh, we could expand that. I think there's some funding that might be available to do that. And then I think we'd be in a better position to answer your question, Lynn. Thank you. I'm going to move us along. Of course, we could probably ask a lot more questions. Thank you for coming a second time. And Elizabeth, we're going to ask you to participate, if you're still here, in our work group conversation around 11 to 14 years, if, if you're willing to and able to stay. Thank you very much. And now we're going to move to 7.0, Perceptions of Parents of Elementary Level EL Students on EL Program Pro Progress. Welcome, David. Welcome. <laughs> David Bautista. Good morning. Chair Cordes, Oregon Education Board member Nancy, thank you very much for allowing us to present this um, collaboration report with the Stanford Children. I have uh, the members of my team that uh, actually they participate in different uh, parent organizations to support in the information, all of them in the different capacity. 
from um, uh, Rudy Ann and Marquisha working in equity issues with parents, the Tiger 12 team, Marta Martinez in our uh, network of dual language programs across the state, their uh, A uh, team going to the different school districts and providing information. He just came from uh, Woodmore School District to explain in Spanish about the report card. Uh, April uh, looking into the Native American uh, group in our state, which is a not, not a, church, a challenge. So everybody is in, in tune with uh, the report from Stands for Children. Uh, the things that we learn from uh, Stanford Children Report perceptions are no different from the con conclusions that our Deputy Superintendent uh, uh, Rob Saxon is saying. There are silos of excellence in Oregon, but those silos of excellence can need to be replicated across, across the state. One of the important aspects that the report highlights is the need for parent communication. The need for parent communication is uh, critical in order for parents at their time to continue supporting the development of, our, of, our, of their children. Uh, Title III is not particularly very uh, pointed in, in terms of uh, parent involvement as Title I or Title, C, or Title I-C. However, we can learn from Title I-C in terms of how to uh, increment uh, participation from uh, parents. Uh, for example, Columbia Gorge, the Dalles, uh, Mo um, uh, Mount Hood, all of that uh, particular area, they're going to have in May, May 3rd, uh, a big gathering regarding information for parents. They were going to be to provide that, that kind of information. So those are the, the important aspects to highlight in terms of districts in region doing, the, doing this work. The other uh, important point that they highlight is that English language profici proficiency results. Uh, one of the, uh, the logistics that we have with the English language proficiency assessment is that that window is from January to April. So many of our districts wait, wait, wait for the students to learn English in order to apply. Then it comes that by numbers, then the results take six weeks. We're talking about mid-July. Uh, parents and, and, and whatever information is gone. So that, that's, the, that's the logistic of how and why those uh, reports come uh, so late. In terms of uh, monitoring, uh, the language acquisition field is a very specialized field that even uh, uh, the people who are working, uh, uh, continually working on this, they need to be updating themselves to be clear about what is, how is it moving this, this body of uh, research. So uh, in terms of providing information for the parents, in terms of the final results, sometimes is, is not very clear, and I'm going to give you a concrete example. We have ELPA from one through five. So the assumption is that my child is going to be moving every year one level, and, and that is not the case. Sometimes it will take one, two years to move from one level to the other because remember that we're working on four language components, and those four language components is the aggregate in order to understand the result. Um, the number five, uh, uh, Stanford children, uh, children mentioned about the state to be clear on the pro, uh, program model revisions. That is something that we have our team undertaken uh, right now and it's underway. We are providing information every month to our districts regarding where we are in terms of uh, program definition and what are the practices in terms of our program definition. And uh, the last one that is extremely important and very well taken is uh, Stanford Children recommend, suggests that the Oregon Department of Education provides um, information in the main uh, languages and there is clear information for the parents regarding the, the strategies, the program, and uh, the advancement of the, of the students. I think we we um, conclude that that's something that we're going to be uh, doing in, in this 
in this kind of ways. Could that include something like a trajectory, like uh, you talked about uh, the proficiency levels, and I'm sure there's research around what's the range for kids for each of those levels. So I know, for example, moving through level one, there's a range of time that's sort of an average. Is there a way to provide that as part of that information? Absolutely. We can provide illustrations in terms of the language expectations. For example, conversation will be very quick and the writing will take some time. Absolutely. Okay. Great. Any? Um, I just wanted to ask a couple other questions. Let's see. Um, so on the I know the ELPA takes six weeks. Is there anything uh, that can be done to speed up that time? Is it a resource issue, number of people? Are there some things that we could help or recommendations you would want us to help you push through to improve that? Uh, absolutely. Remember, and the good thing that you are superintendent, <laughs> remember that when we finalize the, uh, all the data for the district, all the districts, it goes to the district and your district has a window of opportunity to uh, look at the data if it's correct. And then you send us to us, to the Oregon Department of Education uh, Assessment Department, and they look at it, and then they do a, a second run, and then you said everything is correct, and then we send the reports. So that's the, the hold up in terms of, I, I can talk with the assessment department, what would be, but, um, the only thing that they will say, well, David, we open up the window in December, which is going to be two weeks, or end of November, and then November, and, and that's the holdup in terms of uh, information. Great. So one of the things I know we talked about early on when we started the ELL Collaborative was this whole idea of superintendents becoming knowledgeable mm -hmm. about the issues around the ELL, and I think this is one we could probably very easily call out. Uh, so that we understand the, the holdup is at the, super, at the school district level and so we look at our processes to identify how do we speed that up and get that information out. So another question I had about the report, because I know that was a big part that we've been looking at in our district, what is the recommendation or the requirement from ODE in terms of informing the parents? Is there another report that comes out and are we required? I don't need, I have to go check in my own district what we're doing, but I'm curious what does ODE uh, require? And, and in terms of uh, the requirement, every district has to comply with dates in terms of what the parent needs to know about their child moving into the English language proficiency. That is given probably uh, is 30 days in the, from the first day of class. Well, absolutely, um, many parents will say, <laughs> uh, Last year, this was the growth of my child, and right now I'm seeing that it's not growing. I have to wait one year. I think that has to be part of the, what it says right here. It has to be part of the um, a report card evaluation that the, the teacher provides information to the parent regarding the growth of the child. This is one, this is one element only. The English language proficiency assessment is one element right. of the multiples. Right. I'm just curious um, about all the way from what ODE requires or recommends, what actually gets done at the district level, to what level do teachers know and report and take ownership of that, and then to what degree then are we helping parents do that? And that's probably a longer answer, but I'd love to learn more about that too. So so we can help at the district level, but as superintendents, we can help statewide yes. move that forward. And there, there are two elements right here of the state uh, English language uh, uh, plan. The number two, the, the parent is a goal number three, and the capacity building is goal number two. That has to be at all levels, all legislators understanding what we have at the state level because we have resources, language resources, all the way to the classroom and the parent level. Great. So speaking about the goals of the uh, ELL plan, if you want to move into that, that would be great. And Absolutely. Before you do, I just want to thank you. I am so excited that one of the, our goals originally was to talk about how do we talk about all kids who've been in, and I love the ever ELL designation and the fact that we're actually going to collect that data and learn from. For those of you who are listening might not know what I'm talking about is we've been capturing data on our ELL students and then when they exit the program, 
we lose track of who were the kids in the program. So essentially, we have been losing the opportunity to learn what did we do that was successful for the kids who exited and how did they do as they went on on their career. And by just simply having that one more sort of label around ever ELL, we can now look at the whole scope of what's going on and compare what we're doing with kids who are successfully exiting and hopefully staying successful in the system versus those who stay in the program too long. So thank you. I know that was a big piece that we talked about moving forward and you move forward on that one. So thank you. Thank you. So go ahead on your report. Absolutely. And you had the opportunity to receive this in advance, so we did uh, um, a narrative for each one of uh, uh, the goals of the state English language uh, plan. So the first one deals with uh, tools and resources, which we are working um, in collaboration with uh, many of the districts in terms of what they're seeing that is working. Uh, one of the prime notes that we have uh, right here is that the, e, the English uh, Learner Strategic Plan it, it is proactively addressing the opportunity <coughs> gap that there, there exists. In, in that said, it also provides opportunity to support all teachers, uh, what we call mainstream teachers, and absolutely provide support for the teachers that are working with uh, students that are acquiring English. So that's the, the whole system. In, in, in looking at the whole system, every member of the equity team is designing, implementing, and monitoring multiple projects that focus exactly on the opportunity gap and absolutely in, in, in tune with the English uh, learner plan, the state English language uh, plan. One of the things that we have in development of tools and uh, practices that have proven uh, successful is the network of uh, dual language uh, uh, project. Uh, for that project, we were able uh, to get the services of the, I believe, in, in my uh, uh, opinion, one of the most successful researchers in dual uh, language programs in the nation, Dr. Catherine Linhon, in which they're providing a support for our, a network every single month. And they're, they're started with a baseline of looking at the districts, how they're working, what are the elements that they have the, the districts, and from there provide recommendation. That was uh, well received by all of our districts in, in, in general, looking at what is working, what do we have. And what they have is a rubric of seven elements from looking at parent engagement, leadership, uh, curriculum, uh, teacher uh, uh, um, capacity, all those elements factor in to have a solid tools and resources. That, that was uh, the one. Anything like that? And uh, by, by the way, Martha is a University of Oregon, I think the only one in Oregon with a, a PhD in dual language uh, acquisition. <laughs> and then uh, highlighting that. Uh, the second one is uh, all of them, the EA are e extremely important. However, the number one is capacity building. One of the things that uh, Mark at the beginning, he was uh, making an emphasis on the resources of uh, the students when they come to our uh, doors, in our school doors, is to value the resources that they bring. And if we are able to nurture those resources, at the end, what do we have? We can have a lot of resources for Oregon. And I'm talking about language resources. It might be the case that we don't have the 120 languages across the state, but we have 73% the, the nominant that is Spanish, so we can take advantage of that number to nurture that and to continue. Uh, Hillsboro School District recently invited another set of uh, researchers to their district, uh, Dr. Virginia Collier and, and Wayne Thomas, and they provide research of all, all North Carolina and how North Carolina is doing with the dual language programs. And what they are pointing out is students with other languages are becoming bilingual in English and Spanish and maintaining the other language. 
So it can, it, it can be that. So those are the things that other, other states, we can learn from other research that is out there to see what is working. So capacity building for our um, legislators to understand the importance of language resources at the state level and continue to support in that all the way to uh, our common uh, citizen here in, in Oregon. Family engagement, <laughs> which is uh, address one important collaboration work from Stanford Children that it continues to highlight the importance of if, if there's one parent that doesn't know how to navigate the system, we really need to do that, that effort to go farther and support all of our parents because it may be a, a question of time or maybe a question of uh, trust in the system and we, we need to provide that trust in the system. Um, number four, uh, we're talking about a cadre of experts. We've been uh, extremely successful. Um, Dr. Mar Marquisha Smith have been interacting with the different universities that we have at the state and all the universities that we're working with in this area are having a conversation on how to support the, e the English uh, uh, language state plan. So those are the, the elements that we're bringing to our, our um, uh, cadre of experts to advise into what, how the plan is going. For example, Oregon State University uh, professor Karen. Karen Thompson is helping us in the whole uh, alignment of assessments for the state with research from different places all the way to bring in uh, Stanford University to work with us in terms of uh, aligning uh, uh, an open massive course for all of the uh, teachers in, in Oregon. That would be a, a move. Uh, a scale up, looking at the, at, at the different successes that our, our uh, schools and districts are having, those are the work that we are uh, showcasing with others. This was extremely important, and you saw it probably March 13 and March 14 in the ELL uh, State uh, Conference, where more than 800 participants look at practices from the biggest uh, school district, which is Portland, to the smallest school district looking at the different practices and asking us, we want more information about this district in this area. So that was uh, a, good, um, a good element for scaling up. Dominique, a quick question there. Do we have any way of identifying students at the state level, statewide, of students who are participating in dual language programs so that we can compare data across districts Absolutely. about that beyond the, the eight that are in the program. Absolutely. And, and one of the things you, I think you heard already from Brian Reader, a report on the 5,000 5, cohort, mm -hmm. our next step is into looking into the different schools that they have uh, and their information from fifth grade all the way to kinder to see how the, they were moved and see what was the, the mm -hmm. type of support that they received. Yes. So districts have a way they're entering that data at the through the student information system so you can get access to that in reports? Right now, from 2006, we can do that all the way. Okay, mm -hmm. great, thank you. Uh, the ALIGN assessment, uh, as we mentioned, right now we have, with the U.S. Department of Education, a modification for uh, the annual measurable objectives. Uh, number one, how the students are moving from one level to the other. We have a modification in the way that students are going to be exited before five years and after five years. So we have that, and, and that will give elements for these aligned assessments. The other, um, our deputy superintendent uh, um, direct us to look into, we have different school districts that are using native language instruction, and they have to demonstrate that they are at grade level so we're working on the Spanish assessments already. Uh, three, four, five. I'm looking into Marta because Marta's following that conversation. Three, four, five to have it ready for our districts for next school year. And they can use that as a way to demonstrate that they're at grade level. Which assessment is that? Uh, that, that would be, right now, we're, uh, we're looking into Aprenda, what they have. 
that would be that would be a prime data set. Number number seven, uh, all of this is to understand that uh, the education of all of our children is everybody business. The education of English language learners is everybody business. So the the state uh, state plan provides uh, different elements to provide knowledge for all educators at, at the level of uh, language acquisition. One of the things that uh, we need to know at the beginning, you have that data, that the first number is 56,000 active English language learners. But the important part from, from my standpoint that's, is the second, that we have 67,000 additional that have been moving from the program. So together, we have nearly 120,000, 116,000, give take. So that's the ever ELL. Exactly, exactly. That put us into the, the notion that every one of our teachers are going to have English language learners in their classroom. Okay. And uh, the last one, uh, universal preschool, that I don't think <laughs> anybody will will uh, disagree with that. And uh, the other, the, the emphasis that we need to put into this uh, strat uh, goal is that we have, there is a lot of research in terms of language and culture for students three to five to support the students. That's what we, yeah. Um, I just wanted to throw out a question. We're gonna talk about it today in our small groups and I, um, I, I'm just curious about whether you're open to the idea of looking at also um, supporting the uh, development of the easy CBM Spanish measures as well, just because so many districts are already using them. Having been involved in the beginning of that, and I'm not really attached to an assessment, it's just that now the KRA is using the easy CBM for those academic measures, and so a lot of the school districts that uh, we're already using EC, easy CBM. One of the way of helping the teachers identify that we have some uh, flow through lines and that some of these initiatives are are getting really aligned is is by sharing with them. Look, it's the same assessment. It's not a different assessment. And so I would just love to suggest that there are a number of districts already doing that. I don't think it would take a heavy lift. That everything's really in the place of that. It just needs a little bit of resource. The initial measures that were created uh, in the Easy CBM in Spanish were done sort of whatever money could be captured. Um, I don't think it'd be a huge resource list, and I think it's nice to have a couple, especially that one was developed at U of O, and so they've done a lot of work with correlation with Oaks, and I know they're already doing work to correlate that as as. Uh, the Smarter Balance comes on board. So like I said, I don't really care about so much about the name of the assessment. It's just there's one that we're already using. It's really low cost. If we have another one, that's great because then we can look at which are doing the best in terms of providing us that information. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Wasn't there, I'm trying to remember which number on the goals when we originally did that was about the teacher preparation part. Did I just center that one? No. Okay. Which uh, Teacher preparation, because I know so much work, thanks to uh, Vicki Chamberlain and all the higher ed folks, I just think it's really exciting how much work has really uh, been achieved. I, I just know that I think he gives me some more information about what they want to That'll be later. And later, not and today. It's coming in the OEIB yes. meeting. Okay, perfect, <laughs> perfect. So you just report on that then. So I just would like to say thank you to all of you. It's exciting to see a whole department that's really focused on the equity and the ELL. I know last year at this time we were all excited. We had at least one person <laughs> taking responsibility for this plan. And I'm just really excited and celebrating in my heart where we were last year at this point and where you've moved with this plan. And just one more thing, not that I want to add work to your plate, but I would love it at when you get to that point where you feel like we could put together a report, maybe parts that are already there, that really is sort of the state of VLLs and the current work we're doing that could be captured in some way that we could communicate with all the districts, all of our stakeholders and so on, because you are doing a lot of work. And I, I was just sharing this within our region, those of us who were in the original ELL collaborative where some of these recommendations started, 
Um, a lot of those people have no idea how much work is going on at the state level because they're buried in their districts. And I just think it's time to start celebrating some of the progress that we've made. And because of all of you, I also think it would be a great way for each of us to really understand and attach a face and a name with the work specifically that's going on. There's been so much change at ODE and all for, for the, you know, it's all been great change. But people will ask even me, and I'm in these meetings where I get to see people, do you know so-and-so who's taking responsibility for this? No, I don't know. But So if there's any way for us to do some marketing communication around that so we can celebrate that, I think it'd be a great thing for us to take back to regions, to superintendents, to the ELL Alliance, and all those places where the people who really are invested in this work could celebrate with us where we've been. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then a suggestion was the summer uh, summer COSA panel. Is that already in place, or that would I don't be know, a place we be. could do that? <laughs> that should be up front. That'd be great Seven because days. we could even just tap people in our district and say we really want you to go to this session so you get to know and then these people and the work that's going. So. But I know you have a lot of work to do, and you're making great progress, so I don't want it to slow down that work. But I think it'd be great to celebrate the progress. Thank you for Thank putting you. this together. And David, if you can stay, we'd Absolutely. like to have you be a part of the conversation. Absolutely. So uh, we are, I think, a little bit, let me check We're my on time. agenda. We're, We're on time. And I'm just wondering if we could take a quick five-minute break before we work into our yes. group. I think we could participate better if we had a quick break. So it's 11:25 at 11:30. No, well, six minutes, seven minute break. At 11:30, let's be in our seats, ready to move to the next part. So, Lynn, um, we're going to have you on the phone for this work group session. So. That work group will stay right here by this phone so you can hear and contribute. And there's a couple of documents you want to pull out. Thank You'll notice you. that thanks to your recommendation, we were able to revise the um, scope of work document that you should have received as a color-coded uh, chart. Yep. And then Got it right the here. Then Thank we gave you. you a copy of, a, uh, I call it a reference list, really. It's all of the, the things that we've been talking about through the year, except for today's, obviously. So that's a handy reference sheet. But the most important one is um, a recommendations Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. Do you see that? Yeah. Yes? Yes. OK, so that's what. Um, we will have you focus on, and you don't, your group won't do all of it, but you'll be focused on the first three recommendations for early learning, the next five for English language learners, and then ten recommendations for educator quality. Okay? And the other work group, okay. the other work group will focus on the others, and hopefully we'll have time at the end to compare notes. Okay? Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
charts that are color-coded. One that shows our scope of work, and the other one is color-coded in the same coding, multiple pages, and it says first draft recommendations. You should also have uh, a document that says reference. You'll need that for the conversation. And we are now at the time in the year where what we're trying to do with this committee is get clear about what recommendations do we want to take to OEIB for them to move forward or suggest it moves forward. And so Hilda and I did some prior thinking, not to think for you, but to hopefully organize a vast amount of information that we've received in all these reports. So the color coding of the recommendations matches the color coding in the category on our scope of work. That's why we've color coded right. that so, way. So Hilda, can I just confirm that what I'm looking at is the um, revised scope of action, color coded, dated April 6th? Yes, and then you also have first draft recommendations. That's the other Excel spreadsheet that we sent. Yeah. Okay. You have both of those? Got okay. It. And then do you also have the paper that says task for prioritizing recommendations? I'll just read those directions. That's pretty good. Okay. So this is what we're actually going to do in the groups. Hilda's going to explain. Um, Mark will facilitate the 11 to 14 and the rural uh, conversation. And in my group will be early learning, ELL, and educator quality. We're inviting any staff present in the room to participate. Um, and I know specifically we have Keith and David, if you would be willing to participate in my group, and Lisa, okay, uh, for early learning and ELL. And on team two, which is the one Mark's going to facilitate, it'd be Mark, David, Hilda, Elizabeth, and is there anyone else? Vicky can do Can we talk Vicky? And Vicky, would you be in oh, that group? sure. Okay. <laughs> And that group is going to move over there. The other group is going to stay right here so we can be close to the phone with Lynn. So, Hilda, you want to explain? Who? We're, we're trying to save the state agencies. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, that's where we're going to go. And, Nancy, you get to pick whichever group you okay, like. Okay, I'll rotate it. around. How's that? That's so, great. Uh, the directions are very simple. First of all, we want to make sure that you read the second column, which is the potential recommendations for clarity. And um, we will have a recorder in each group that makes any suggested edits or additions. And then the second step you'll do is 
see whether or not you think we've correctly identified the box that we've marked for this is a potential investment, this is a potential policy action, or this is a potential action or recommendation and who we're making it to. The third um, task is that for each recommendation, um, we have just said whether or not we think it's linked to an achievement compact metric for either K-12 or community college or four-year. And then the last thing, the most important, is that we're asking you to take a look at column uh, that's marked potential impact on student outcomes and just give it a high, medium, and low as well as the Im impact on equity. Do, we, do you feel that we've correctly labeled that? So this way we have a way of sorting through quite a few recommendations and beginning to let those surface that really have the largest impact on the metrics that we are tracking on the achievement context. Is that clear? Any questions? So say again which one we're identifying Pymedium and um, the uh, so the fourth two. column and the fifth column, it says potential impact okay. on student outcomes and potential equity impact. Okay. So we're going to take 20 minutes and then we'll check in with you, which will be right at noon, to see if you're close to coming back to report. If not, we'll give you five more minutes. So that'll be sort of the warning, so that we have plenty of time to come back here and identify those. We will not vote today. Uh, we'll bring it to the next uh, meeting. And at next meeting, we do have some other groups coming forward, so we'll continue to add to the list of recommendations. Any questions? Lastly, um, Seth has put up on the screen, um, and I don't think we, uh, this was from the OEIB meeting uh, previous month, the, um, a, a way that Whitney Grubbs has helped the board look at their strategic strategies and budget priorities. So. Um, it's just a reference sheet for you if you really are not familiar with that. We have copies as well. Okay, let's okay. move to our groups. Lynn, I'll send that to you right now. Okay. Thank you all. Yes. It is. It is. Don't move down, Dave. Okay. Somebody else could sit here. There's seats right up here. I have to take these seats so we're close to the phone so I'm um, here. Everybody. Right. I did. Uh, I don't. Do we want to sit over here or sit down here? Sit down here. We're going to come around. Yeah, please come up to one of these seats. How's Vicky? Hey, how are you, Mark? Hi. I'm the student. I'm the yeah, so much talent in this group. This might have the answers to this. We're all here right here. Maybe you can help me make sure that I'm ready to do this. I certainly can. I figured you'd ask. Exactly. 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 Are you? Yeah. You know, Hilda, I'm supposed to facilitate this, but, you know, I'm very good if you want to just start running with it. You, you know exactly what you're looking okay. for. Okay, so, Lynn, can you hear us? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. We're going to start with the yellow area, which is early learning, and then goes into English language learners. Uh, so let's look at, let me give you a minute to take a look at, let's look at the first two and see if we have first clarity for, clarity, edits, or additions. And then I'll read off the next part. Lisa's going to ask you All right. So, so we're um, looking at the scope of work right now or the recommendations? We're looking at the recommendations. Okay. I'm sorry it's not color coded for everybody, but it does say first draft recommendations. And we only have two areas, but we have a lot of recommendations. So let's look first at rural. And you will, will probably remember that we had several questions at the beginning of the year about are there 
significant differences in needs that are that need to be attuned to the rural Any changes, communities. edits, and so additions? Glad Mark is here Do you have group. this one? Yes. Um, okay. So we had several folks that came yeah, in and talked with us. We learned just about what the regional research is. The regional head lab is doing. Um, we listened to the class coaches and what they've learned from um, working with small districts, and we teased out four um, specific so recommendations. So okay. um, those are listed in the So you want to. Um, have a better understanding of what those are, or so, I can just clarify. Yeah. If Where does the um, what so is the timeline come in on this grid? Yeah. So the very first one is the timeline for when we send the recommendations to OEIB. Really is that what you're asking? High, um, so for the completion of the Spanish version of the KRA, so we'll have that done by when? I don't know that we've put any timelines on any of these, so if you want to suggest that, maybe it's part of the conversation about high, low, or high, medium, or low in terms of outcomes. I mean, I guess if it's yeah, high, I, I, so I, I would respectfully suggest that the timelines are all, and that because two things, one, we need to know so that we can tell you know, our stakeholders, but secondly, there, it's right going to be now, very hard to prioritize all this work because yeah. it won't all happen at once, and we're probably going to have to make some choices about what we do first. Okay, what did you mean by all? And you know, it's a fascinating um, It's everything needs. to know when it Maybe gets done. Oh, in terms of the impact on the achievement compact, in terms of the impact on student outcomes, if something's going to be done in three years, um, that's going to affect our overall success, and there are some things that it's fine to do in three years. Other things that we probably need to get done in a very in very short order. For example, I would say that the um, Spanish KRA is is a critical task item, um, and some of the other things are perhaps less important. The legislative mandate to have full day kindergarten in 2015 has some real implications. That kind of thing. Okay, so getting those fixes to the carries so that um, we can say this fall, this fall or next fall. Everybody. Well, I think it to me is a relation. These are related to each other, and, and I wouldn't want to speak for Jada because I don't know how she sees getting all this done in her work plan. I'm just suggesting that for our grid, a category would be the timeline. Okay. Okay. So let's. Let's recommend that, and I'll ask Hilda to work with each of the people so that have responsibility for these to give us an idea of that timeline and when that can yes. That would be great. Thank okay. you. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. Um, we need leaders in terms of marking high, low, um, those medium uh, impact on, on students, I think if we're talking about exactly. ELL students, that's, these are going to be high said, in terms of outcomes, both of those. There already is a okay. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. What other column? Potential equity impact. Do you think that's the same? High. Building yes. statewide support system. So it's exchanging this body. Okay. And, and we, do we agree that it links to yeah. the achievement yeah. compact? To me, to me, it's just an important thing if people are doing it. Any other Feedback. Doing everything down, uh, ignoring something uh, successful that they've done. We're going to get the line. So it definitely takes investment. So, um, but is it going to have a part of the and it's a specific action or practice? If they're already doing it, it's not a huge investment. It's just bringing out best practice. Yeah. And the second one is that um, we heard it's from the districts. Um, oh, okay. I don't think we need a policy. Do you? Um, yeah, that would just be giving it to ODE. Right. You don't need a policy for us for you guys to work on. That. So the second one was based on the fact that um, with so many right. things, and so we put that down as an investment. And sometimes I wonder really if they put policy a lot of things from the state perspective, meaning it could be there, um, doesn't, sometimes doesn't require legislative action. There's a lack of or establishing priorities for you in the phased in timeline for very small so, districts where the uh, superintendent is also like a teacher in the school and administrator in the school, a bus driver, a coordinator, all of that. And so there was a recommendation to perhaps provide guidance on ODE Do you need any and phased in timeline language that are that's basically realistic calling out the value of hand jump assessments? Would that be helpful? Jump on a time, but not 
have a count of at least seven So is that something that um, becomes a policy in OAR? And is that something the state board would be asked to look at? How do you, how do you draw the line, though? So this was something we got into when we were doing Okay, so I wrote that down then as a potential to figure out something. Every single year who the small remote district Okay, were. let's go on to the next two. Ensure that all students in Oregon have access to I mean, full day I mean, kindergarten is what FD stands right, for. But if you have a Leverage the school calendar for needed PD. And Make this a priority just, within um, state facility grant and address funding needs for personnel and resources. So this was the superintendent's report. They had uh, these as recommendations. We grouped them into one and said, we want to support that all of those things get so addressed I, I, I'm just saying, if you're going to make exceptions because of your size, uh, it, would, you maybe need to look at your definition of go ahead, Lynn. Needed. I don't want to interrupt you both hard and you can't see people. I know, you're fine. <laughs> okay, I, I would not concur that this is a priority for state facility grants. Um, I think that's a, I think that's a discussion that has to occur in a broader context of funding priorities. I think if you just say that's the priority, um, I'm, well, A, I'm not sure it's necessary, and B, I'm not sure it is the priority. So that would be the only caveat I would have there. Okay. Anything else? Because they have bought into what classification sure. they're in. Mm -hmm. and sure. So they just by removing that aspect of so like the, the rest that's around it five, is still a priority, five, but just yeah. from a facility grant. I think what you're saying is that the facility so the grant itself, prioritizing it for kindergarten might not be appropriate. You're not saying don't find a way to provide facility for people who need that, correct, Lynn? And that's state for the third point is that um, there's a lot of required reporting, and this is sort of tied into the, the second one here. Uh, do we need like a leveraging or our building resources to bring together the goal without new construction, without mapping the capital? I don't think. I, 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 I think that 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 have happened is just let's go to kindergarten and let's put millions of dollars into kindergarten when actually in some areas there's there's probably existing unused capacity. And there certainly is in for the public Okay, um, and, and I think part of the issue is where people, especially small districts who really don't have any other capacity, that we at least find a way to address that. So I'm uh, assuming you meant, yes, we want to address it, but you're saying it, there might be some other way of going about it. Yeah, yeah, and it needs to be the district level. So one of the questions I have from all of you, I feel pretty strongly about it as a superintendent, it is not a requirement that you move to full-day kindergarten. Do we believe that it ought to be? I believe that one of the things that's going to happen is right now is that a recommendation we want to support. That's what the superintendent's group is saying, is that we recommend that all students have access to full day that it would be an equity issue. Well, that already got a so that I think is just based on feedback. I think what's important here is that the law that passed does not say it's required. So there's still legislation. I think that would be we could recommend it. We could urge it. But there's going to be an individual district, and not a but in the end, legislation says you have a choice. So this is going to be more through. Really the ethical lens of what's right. Especially if you have the other is, is the situation in those cases. So I think this one needs to also have OEID added yeah. to it. Um, and my guess is that there will be a revamping of a plan for all strategic investments. So in terms of who is this directed to, I hear Nancy saying it's not necessarily legislative. We know that it doesn't say you have to in the legislative statute. I think that's what the superintendents are recommending, is that we, that we change that. But I hear you saying maybe we put the onus on the school Well, I think if you're going to open up the legislation again, you're going to open up the legislation and just know there could be some very unintended 
that's where it's just, that's in the so, so you're here's two things. Go ahead, Lynn. Kids going I really appreciate you raising that because that's what I think is that I think media and the media is Again, there are there's always the risk of unintended consequences. So I, think I also think it's really critical that, that if we or anyone is going to say we have to have full day to have both political and financial implications. It's, 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 it's a specific rule of thumb of a high if graduation rate. We can't achieve the 40, 40, 20. Yeah. I, I mean, I, really we all think full day kindergarten would be great. Yeah. 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 I'd like to have a fourteen. You think that there's also issues with rural community colleges? And the third grade proficiency has connection. I think it's better than that. Yeah. You'll notice also there's a couple of kindergarten prep that are rural. We need them under educated qualities as low areas of that. What happened? Looking at ways that we might be in the community. Okay. Good caution there. Because I don't think anybody wants to go backwards on that. Intends to try to go forward. So we'll change that. In terms of equity and marks high, Potential impact I mean, on outcomes. It's high. Okay. Achievement to the, the rural achievement involved. compact mm -hmm. link to that. Much. Yes. Um, high. Mm -hmm. So that's and a good question to add. Action or practice? Yes. Uh, More is, so which than is an OEIB being 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 legislative. Well, I guess we get an update on how they're going. Okay. I think there's still a lot Let's of Let's move to the next one. Things. Analyze available data. So, w, this is, and, and this there's is special a issues for uh, rural districts oh, yeah, to get involved in supports we can give them. Yeah. This is the workforce development. That's strategy. So the rural schools are so Yeah, I think it is, mm -hmm. especially when you're talking about facilities. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. actually, so this is, is it an investment strategy for OEIB? Is there something we're going to recommend that OEIB do in terms of the investment? And I think their hope was that OEIB was going to say to the legislature, we need to fund for the It's even more so keeping our kids in the region. So, no, if you want to be on that. People are obsessed with Where the controversy on the recommendation is around the facility. So there's that. Um, and I think there's going to be more coming you know, I'm just telling you what I hear people say um, is that um, this is passed in 211. I'll see you there. <laughs> <laughs> name it, yeah. In Oregon, the North State, and another state in the state. Uh, I think they had a question. Fourth grader for facilities that came right from now the whole year's worth of um, to really work with your community. Oh, the scope of action was the original document. So, you know, that would be where. And without that, I think it can be a strong recommendation. I think with that, they ever, they ever open up a bigger conversation. We're having in our uh, okay. central urban okay. cores. So let's go on to the next one, available, analyze available data. This is the Brian Reader information that we shared. No, no, I'm just saying that so you have parallel. We said that it wasn't linked to the Achievement Compact, but I think it is on uh, graduation rate. I mean, so I just. And in terms of potential student outcome, yes. We're talking about understanding the levels of proficiency and how we will be school. Equity impact. Yeah. Yeah. Really? I, I, so, uh, is it an investment stuff, strategy? It's more public. about research. First three years is high yeah. yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Is there exactly. anything we need to call this? Anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Really okay. And the, the, the interesting thing is, is practice but yes and no. The thing is, Vicki, that there will be potentially anything else on that one? Retreat this summer. Include ever ELL status and longitudinal databases. Is that already there? Okay. Okay, we want to go to LEM 14. Let's go to LEM 14. Okay. And we put OEIB and HEC just so that we make sure there's that link and that it goes all the way through the 20 system. Yes, it does. So the first one was something that came up frequently in conversation. Even to get it to continue on through the HEC? Is that part of the longitudinal database conversation already? Okay. Um, so I'll put that as a question. Yes. yes. I need to go back to your previous one. Well. Sure. I, I put it here because it came up in the conversation. Uh, Lynn said, I think it's the point. We have a solution for third grade. Yeah, it's about 90% agile. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. With babies and flexibility. Then I guess if the district thinks the best way to get there is to spend some of their resources on facilities. You see what I'm saying? So it's just, it's really looking K3 and knowing the start is part of the solution. Um, as far as the data is concerned, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, especially to know redesign for okay. secondary remediation. Yeah. Yeah. 
and that's anything else on the ever yellow one obviously if we mark everything we need to i do think it's an equity issue so maybe as we can impact on the elizabeth can student call outcomes that one's probably going to come up eventually yeah. mental ed recommendation right. and maybe i just have a developmental category because i really think it's some of them are just but the yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. we can learn so much that we can't learn right now right. 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 if you don't have that and to go um, back to choosing prior to the assignment in community colleges related to the electric department. Recharging of a longitudinal data system. Well, that, that affects the pay rate and the workload and the, and the, the, workload and the, and the um, design expectations for the job. Around the key research but questions it's, you want it's to up to the so college to set the priority who they're going to and where so they're going to be full time positions. Just from the standpoint, this is what a check or a Here's the key research question you need to be mentioned. That's the workload. So in the key public bargaining agreement, you know, so the senior thing drops because then that keeps the policy marks at the different agencies for fighting to have their own right. right. They're, they're, they're totally different jobs. Um, you know. So basically the, the collective bargaining agreement says if you're over 0.5 or 0.6, you're under that, you're at that. Right, and we were going to write that in, but we were assuming because now he is in. But I always like to call that out. Yeah, that's a good point. But they have some. I'm just curious. Can you hear all the discussion, Lynn? How you make this happen? I can. I, so I think you know, I, I can happen. I'm not just thinking about data. But what we can do is talk about creating uh, incentives. Because and of the even, for example, calling uh, out um, what are the characteristics of who most effective and teachers so, who are um, able to make a difference for students in their new development. This is an Things we've learned from things we've done in the past and all the other kids. It's its own category. It's its own category. And I would just, we I'll just add, for the limited system that gets uh, overlooked a lot, the adjuncts, for, um, the research shows in, in the classroom there's not a lot of difference, you know, in fact, so it's the effort to teach better yes. full time, and but the, the thing um, is it's more outside the classroom and then the student support really and high level just level flying and out of the class, so that's really high level focus on things. It's really so, okay. I guess that's, that's all I have to add yeah, to that. Yeah, I would rather focus on the elderly side. There's, there's a huge legislative trust even before the cover of Oregon uh, effort that, I can that we will never be able to get data on the early learning side. And in a document, that we what we're trying to do. So I don't have. I put that out experience. there. Okay, I'm so happy to roll my sleeves. I work for a very data driven organization. But I just caution all of us to know what a graduate student is like. And that's what I'm trying to do. Okay, so I'll just add that. Yeah, 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 I'll just and then by research <laughs> questions, just making, making sure that it's used right across now. the P20 so the next for one gathering that information and making assumptions about what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And are we let's move to the next one. We, one we have, on the, let's try in the next, directed. so I can tell that he's just going to keep going too. Let's you try to get through, get through this back. next one in the next five so minutes and then move to the educator quality. Develop P20 communication blueprint to ensure ELs and their families are kept informed and supported across each stage of students. I haven't gotten done with what you were talking about. Yeah. The, yeah. 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 the only yeah. thing that yeah. it yeah. isn't included yeah. in your comment yeah. because you don't have that authority. Well, so I mean, the second crossing one's over to the head. Right. Yeah. So we're just given that to develop. So with that would require maybe some kind of policy um, is being addressed by SBAC. I mean, it's some push there. However, it is going to need. Do we think that it's achieved? It's not directly. From all linked the to the chief contact, but eventually we're going to get an assessment. This is the idea of using, it isn't, like uh, we talked about, uh, equity education, using that early information. Is it an investment strategy? 
um, to guide you in an investment around how to help the remediate things that are not helping the in-house to improve it. As a place, memorial at your is it this part of the development? It's a little bit of the it is, but it's uh, also uh, the SBAC Court of College okay. group. We'll just say possibly in the future, and that would be something we check in. Next one, identify and pilot specific ELA interventions for students not making specific significant progress in language proficiency um, by eighth grade. Again, this is tied to and uh, the one the above. And the next one is the, mm -hmm. the research from the We heard from, from the, year. this came up first in so the ELL transition. So this is about kind of what's the action we should take once we understand that data and right. state how valuable it was for Identifying pilot specific ELL interventions. So when we know students aren't, do you need policy or investment? That's a key element of the promise pillars. But right now, there's nothing that really says that must occur somewhere. Yeah, in the and we're not assuming these are new tremors. We're talking about kids who've been in that are making progress. Yeah. Early mm -hmm. would be the career standards in high schools. High school, high school, high school, high school. Career, whatever curly stands for. Exactly. So we're going to say, oh, all I know is about the individual plan that we're really looking at that. But they're not making progress. We're using a different intervention. What do we need to do to ensure that people are not going to just keep doing the same thing? That's why the multiple indicators all of them do. Many of them require a first year teachers. We just haven't mandated it. Interesting. Yeah, I wonder how that how that was compared with just. Also, the other polls I've seen mention Klamath where you should do it at IDPCC too, with some kind of mandatory counseling session or right. academic advising session. Sometime in the first term, yeah. Uh, so I'd like to compare how those would work before saying they should offer a Is this specifically for non-native speakers? No, it's just the, uh, we can buy the issue here because there was a recommendation that it's nice to check it would offer some of options in Spanish. And that takes mm -hmm. the investments yeah. in a lot yeah. of different Three ways from developing a plan yeah. to developing what that uh, professional yeah. development is going to be in order to move that along. Do we need policy with that as well? You see what I'm saying? Rather than course, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is. I don't think that you need policy, but I can't speak for ODE. My it only would concern be my perception that, that you probably have all the policy and the laws that you need from Title I, Title II, Title what, III. What gets talked uh, about in a college success course may or may not be embedded in funds common course and state the standards. Equity, the, the leadership in the uh, uh, push <laughs> no, to say no, this is what needs to happen and start So maybe one, here's one happy So we're asking that we you already have a previous group. I'll sit down and right. actually mm -hmm. mm -hmm. play this mm -hmm. topic mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what, that what are other states system. doing? What are the best practices we, we have in our own state? Mm -hmm. I'd like to see that. Isn't it a little so late? It is. It is. For what? Well, well, I mean, if we wait till they choose to go to college to help the kids, we are not using it as an opportunity to get employed. It needs to be a high school. And that will have the yeah. possibility to I mean, in other words, I think it's really about orientation that makes yeah. that gets over I mean, that comfort issue. Like for us, so I think so I'll be back to these are probably one of the pillars of the question. And the, uh, um, the which groups uh, that Marquisha just getting Mr. Thomas group is working yeah, on. Yeah, just say, I, I mean, that junior, that senior. Is where that is right here. Mm -hmm. like, well, they has to, it has to be yeah. a, a, a joint. So the research has to be 11 to 14. Yeah. Yeah. Like a yeah. anecdotally. All right, makes right sense. And the equity, equity issue, I'm not really doing yeah, I'm sure high schools can say the same. If it's an equity issue. I think there's potential anecdotally. Imp huge impact on numbers. Uh, uh, I think the expectations and have what they have to do when 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 they have to do
so getting the both <laughs> faculty together and administrators together from both exactly. levels because I don't think there is that communication going on and it's just Mark, a finger pointing. And don't from don't your side. We have one. I'd like to make a recommendation that we continue on this work and not worry about the time for a report out because we can okay. do the report out once we change the edits at the next meeting. I think it's more important to stay in discussion. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, okay. Hilda to your right is okay with that. Okay. I just did a thumbs up. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at the nameplate. Oh. <laughs> You're so funny. So, Thank you. This is Lynn, and yes. regretfully, so we're going to have to sign off at this point. We have a um, family that's arrived unexpected, and I need and to I help our staff that, with them. Um, so, um, okay. I will sit back in, but thanks well, for all the good work today, and I will see you in the next meeting. So Lynn, I'll just ask you one thing, and that is when we get the document out, if you'll take a good look at these two sections that we have responsibility for before the next meeting, if you have any other changes or suggestions to send them to Hilda. Great, thank you. Thanks a lot. I'll do it. Okay. So we're on the next one. Ensure that one student identifies students through their educational journey. So this is that idea, and I don't know, maybe it's already happening in Peter's work, but the idea that when a kid enters the system, whether it's birth or wherever, that they get okay, I pay for every kid on birth. Keep it sane through the system. It takes a lot of work at this point. So the next one is sort of tracing to this. What we're discovering is that we have a very non consistent across the state. Well, that's, I mean, that's, I think what we're that's what we're recommending is we want to the career information system so that's or not what the I mean both of them the are based by wonderful things but we still have kids who can wait actually to eat and there's a budget and, and so what we're trying to figure out is where we're not here to get a recommendation about how thing that's political and make sure that every kid has access to now most of the one or the I think we're the only state that doesn't include social security. So there are people feeling like they need to have that also tie in with the heck you talk about a portal to do college financing, but I think it's also not just financing, it's timeline things like that. It would make sense to tie that into identify if you don't know. Is not a career thing or a college thing? We don't yes. use it in a career plan. Okay, yeah. So yeah. I would also tie in the board. Okay, that's from the employment department. But right. do any yeah. of those yeah. states yeah. receive the kids all the way across the yeah. yeah. that many people sharing that? Oh, is that the big, we used to be a big book um, back in the day, right? It's all online. online. It's, it's, online. Online. it's all online now. But I think it's people who are Oh, so it's linked to an idea. Like it's how you can understand the kid, but nobody knows other than them. You know, very That's really CES, though. Yeah, that's the one that's That's CIS is researching a job. But I'm just saying there could be like, if you want it, very specific. Mm -hmm. Right now, the, the next one is actually this revitalized the education plan and yeah, profile, which is required for high school for the to be able to come and identify across schools there, around how that is carried, carried out. out. Was that the career standard? Yes. Yeah. Really consistent. Higher ed already. What does revitalize mean? Oh, that's probably not a good word. But Peter, there could be legislation. Maybe put So we put a question mark and we put that. Choirs? That would be okay. Yeah, that's what it works. Well, how do you this K-12? I don't know what's involved in it. What is it? Basically, there's a requirement if K-12 high school sponsors to do that. Well, we're hearing there's a few things. Sometimes students are just like, oh, you've got to fill this out. Rather than a thoughtful, integrated. In 20 minutes before graduation? Yeah, really. It's linked to the teacher. My senior's going to get his AAFT. We just realized, oh, crap, you guys said that. Already. Okay. So it may be that we um, recommend that there needs effort. to be a, a concerted <laughs> so focus. So it's measuring all of Look at this. Um, that maybe OEIB falls a group together and um, it is helpful. The potential the impact on student outcomes. Yes. I mean, we were thinking about transitions, for example, from K-12 to... And do they all have their own? 
they're all planned. Yeah, they're all to curly. go in and yeah. see if kids were healed. Well, yeah, but the bigger, I think our standard. role more is either us or the, the, um, the state board looking into ways. Way to link the number in order to mm -hmm. I guess that's what you meant by revitalize, then, is uh, revamping it. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's really Make it useful. Budget right? strategy. Yeah. Go so far as to blow up. Would it require oh, budget? Oh, no. no, no. Well, start was, over. What do we want? Revisit. To revisit. Yeah. <laughs> and that would tie in with the um, <laughs> CIS <laughs> and the portals that we're talking about. Yeah, okay. There was and we need to add that. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, but already there. Right now. There's a budget note. So, the next one yeah. is. Um, it wouldn't come out of general. The idea of okay. summer intervention. Right now, um, it's all the same. We're going to come around and graduate a student. They've done their class. Now we can use educator quality, which is where they show up where they aren't accepted. Yeah. Um, First one is form a task force to identify key content for secondary level teacher preparation and support for post secondary success. For students, it's a national figure. That were oh, yeah. announced and sure. had intention to go to college yes. and just didn't. Sure. Because nobody reaches out. Like and one some recommendation that has come up has been. I think this is about um, ensuring certain skills that kids need to be successful in college. Well, the content te teacher teaches now, they're, 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 they're going to focus on the content. Right. They're not going to be able to make it to be able to make it to be able to make a successful college. In those have been they kind of relegated to the yeah. advisory so or to the counselor. In other words, the counselors know that they're yeah. yeah. But do we tell classrooms, teachers, how to help kids know how they're going to be successful in college programs? Even in though it's not just a So it's kind of like the ELL standards. It's identifying what is what is college success look like. Study skills, the number of different things, writing and I see some colleges and a lot of different forms. Also, I think it leads to system masters. Yeah. Whether it's high school or high school, what I find higher ed is about five different people who are supposed to lose certain needs that are never seen in school. That's the also, fact. I think, too. Is There's some a just been a disinvestment uh, of student services from the state right. and the community. Right. I would put it in there. Yeah. So somehow, yeah. it is a reinvestment, but it's so also a reduction of size of what we're saying. A crosswalk job park and bark. Think, think about where everyone's located. I mean, there's yeah. 300 miles in between most of the community and the college is two thirds of the state. I would So, so uh, you know, that's our thing where our so always I think in terms of impacting I'm, I'm the cheaper about compact the does college. because it's what we're University talking about mm -hmm. making them successful in college, which well, is part of the I mean, is is on that that How many can I ask of the kid where this recommendation came out of the from college advice? From which from OEIB? I was with them all over the place as part of my job. Um, I'm not sure. Well, we did staffing turnovers. It will tell us in this document right now. So can I recommend that somebody give us language here about what you would like to see here? If you think that it's important to pay attention to summer intervention. Comprehensive college advising. I don't okay. know if it's college it's advising something. or even just taking a so class in the summer or something to, you know, the study so indicates we're losing them, and I'm not yeah. sure if it's just uh, that's 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 seeing we a form a task force. Does it not need a different a class? Or 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 I will send you the national resource. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, see, this is something that's fine. That would help. Next time we'll have a better idea. Of what I don't remember where some of the recommendations are. Yeah, I know there's a problem. I don't know if there's anything that we're analysis of. I was going to say, this was the PSU study on success of ELLs. Okay. And that uh, it was the idea that they had done a study to say, what are some things we need to do to help the ELLs be more successful? Well, they didn't really have a lot of time last minute. But they actually did about the 10 interactions as they call it. Exactly. All right. All right. Does that help? Yes. Okay. I will send that to you. What did make a difference? All right. So, if you look at the TRIO program, it's probably a TSP. Okay. Well, then look at the data around the TRIO program. Yeah. Because that's exactly what the TRIO program is doing already. And then they do have success rates that are under the And not everybody gets in your trio. Well, no, I mean, you're very specific guidelines and some of them are going to be hard So maybe something modeled on that. I've already broke down both trio and the national study, so.
maybe the three we of us can go through that one, which, one, that one. which is the larger. So the next one thing, is uh, to fully maximize students junior and senior year. This came up through the superintendent's vision statement, um, came up again. Today. So I think our intent was to leave it to you guys. No more half days. Okay, just wanting to know if you need to push. I did not mark it yet just for, um, in policy or I did mark it as a budget strategy under number two. Both the state investments on Can I put that you and Alda and Keith will have a conversation to get through on that? Yeah. 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 All of your efforts are going to be along with all of these just as we do. We don't have a regular genius. We're going to kill our freshmen and sophomores off, and, do, and then we let parents dictate the GMC. Perfect. The right Which we would then class. turn to each of these groups done. to say what do you think is reasonable, <laughs> so that we actually All, do it the right way, like Elizabeth was talking about. Talking about before. Before. And I would put this okay. as a higher it, it, You know, you talk about it. If I, I mean, if I look How many students, for, you know, because for they, they don't go to college, go to school in the same year, end up in this maybe as opposed to any other year, potentially in the fall, students seem to be something for seven years. Smart balance for college interest, but then they take the interest, but then they take a year off school. No, but see, the recommendations that are coming out of Court of College, the only so way that that works, works, that it, it okay. works in lieu of a placement right. test, is so, that the student so stays in and successfully completes the next course. You can have a year off this. Yeah. 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 He can't. He can. yeah. should have four years of math. If math is the kid, he should have four years of math in high school. We have great data on how 20-year-olds that have to have math in their teachers to stay. So we do not have any recommendation here. Okay, well, I, I think we need to the high school the lots of issues. Much like the NC steps on. You don't want us to be open up the ethics law to be reasonable. You may get unintended consequences. That's why we'll get an issue where we need to be very symbiotic with that. Okay, to get money. But it's a teacher to do. Or the EE or the Department of Ethics. And so we need something to system the It's still has been affected by Dave, think about this. <laughs> uh, 24 credits for a diploma. You've got an eight period day. It's more of the ethics. Okay, I'm moving us to the next one. And that's a, that's a we have. dicey. So we don't want it to open the ethics law, but we want to find out how we can compensate in some way and provide incentives for remedial education. So we have put together an OEIB survey, perhaps. This is obviously an OEIB. Have you seen it? Yeah, I'll give you an early draft and look at that. So I'm going to put it to Hilda, Keith, and Vicky. I like it. It is related to... I think Mark here's, here's why I like what you guys are saying, and I'll be yes. you know, the higher ed person about that. Say, K-12 feels like they're packing the burden on accountability and to do it. To, to be your okay. Uh, does it need legislative and policy? And this would help get them to buy it. If we don't want to go up here, yeah, yeah. there was no, no um, guidance. We've gone right. into this. We even well, got we did some it. advice from the ethics. The devil's in the details, right? So it would have to be, if you want that, then the participation rates would be of those who don't have the same rules. Yes, oh yeah. So that's what we would like that. Maybe that's what we could do this. Right, that's what I mean. Because if that's truly what you want, then that gives and us so the cohort to watch. Yeah. It was not and intended to be. Yeah. I have to see what the uh, kind of question how the, the dates or what some okay. achievement context. And this one is about using OEIB right right to support the new TSPC ELL rules for all of our faculty to be able to use ELL knowledge and strategies for all educators and candidates. So our question was, what do you need for support from OEIB? Is there any policy you need? Yeah, is there I investment? Okay. Uh, but I guess in place, the only investment would be uh, with a good so workforce development. Know what we're going to use for. Well, the reason why this policy was because uh, it was too but I think as we look say, at this, this we're going to be forming that helping the students actually successfully complete. Okay, if they are eligible for the high school, you know, you teach them that you know, you know, uh, the kids are in the other high school, the seven graduates, they have high school. I'm just saying, when I'm an adult, I'm more mobile. Yes, period. That's all I'm doing. That's all I'm doing. I'm more mobile. 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 I'm more mobile
at this point, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. we well, understand why. The only whatever it works is the so we, uh, we, just we have to start small. Like we just to find the what where I'm going with this is it can gain us gain us traction on the senior year. So updates on the committee and maybe. Yeah, I would say I don't know if the achievement compact is the place. Right. With the perception those have in post secondary. That's right. I agree it's very important, especially if we're going to be doing a revamping of the system. But yeah, it's, I don't know if the achievement compact would. Different ways to. Wherever, but I don't know if the achievement compact would have the. So that right now is the really TSP. We're talking about redesign the compact. But eventually it will be in higher education. Or. Educator preparation you programs know, would, and schools. So right now I'm just going to put there's some question about whether or not that would be effective. OD. Okay. I think it's good That's information. Yeah. 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 Ye
Yes. Yes. We're like we're almost there. Hours. So uh, we do not have any public okay. input. So okay. And right. what is the? I'll adjourn this as soon as our committee starts. We'll get to we some of these other areas. Okay. Other and so our next meeting will have a Okay. Good. Okay. okay. Right. And we'll revise these. And evidently, and we are going to have to arrange our talks with you or something for budget. But you look at a lot of these things. A lot of yeah, and two, like I said, two of them might be the um, bridge program for the summer and the trio camp seem to tie in. Or, or was it that, yeah, college career, so maybe college success for Good job. You had stepped out when we made the invitation. I know, I had to go to the observation form that would be used. You know, Rob just brought this whole question uh, to us to be the secret. I remember, I remember seeing it. And I'm wondering if yeah, we could ask him very quickly soon to have a conversation with people to see yeah. what would that allow you to do. Yeah, those are the right ones. The guys are going to let waiver to be part of it. And then we have a student service line. He was asking if you want to use one form, if you want everybody to use one form. You're right, they're not. We're aware of that kind of stuff. So, to me, we're already going to lie. We just want to know the location of these things. Um, it's actually going to be a bit of a center. Should we be drinking? God, yes. After, after what, eight months of this stuff? You bet. Good Lord. That's and scaling is what he's talking about. The, uh, right. Okay. And so that is a great problem. Did you hear the policy advisor? No, no, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm going to move us through some of these. And we'll um, uh, the bottom one is uh, the common institutional profiles. That's going to be a uh, plan. Um, that can be with us. Um, okay. Oh, they're the ones that are on the side. Have they been tested or seen anyone in the place? Yeah. Uh, use the network for quality teaching and learning okay. portal to provide oh. <laughs> examples of high quality teaching videos to enhance practice. So this is yeah. Uh, you know, are you guys we're we're just the data that you yeah. see? We begin to call those and put them there as exemplars. Seems like yeah. a brainer to me. <laughs> and I do think it has impact for students, student outcomes, not specifically. So this will be interesting to hear. So the uh, equity. Yes, equity across the classrooms. I don't know that we don't need any policy or investment strategy because we're already developing them. Okay, identify best practice in clinical experiences. That's, you know, we're working, this is part of the so alliance work that we do. And selecting, preparing, cooperating. I'm working on that too. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> we're working on it. <laughs> sure but it should be downstairs. It's no, ma'am. Thank you, though. Yeah, I had I paid for it last time. Thank you so much, Doc. I appreciate it. Yeah. You know where you're going, yeah? That's the sassy thing. Yeah, it's open. Yeah. Okay. So, so if we're, 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 investment? Uh, at this point in time, no. And policies. Uh, at one point, so, once we start getting some of the results of some of the practices and pilots that are being in place, they'll drive the policy. So later, and is this something we want to put in the support category report back to OEIB? Difficulty is from the pilot, we're not always giving data on how things are going. Other than from chalkboard pilot, we anticipate something chalkboard. The difficulty is linking that student chain back to so we really Waiting to see what the data is like, you know, certain the data is the data that we come from. Other than the kind of quality, yeah, this seems to be working much better. So, uh, we're still working on that. But it's active. Data is a question. Yeah, it's very active. You're going down to the bacteria. Study and recommend policy and practice that addresses educator workforce shortages in rural areas. This really is a, um, 
probably you know, I, what we I see when we look at uh, the number of licensed educators in all areas, we're an oversupply. We don't have a shortage. When we look at a shortage, like for special ed, or we look at a shortage in certain areas, and that's, it's all driven by the rural location. Right. So what the rural districts say is, is the dating pool is very small, so we can't attract people there. So it's an investment Dating's strategy. Fun. Well, that's, yeah. So what they do is, is do you need to invest funds, right. or is this yeah, a budgeting issue that provides incentives for individuals so to locate Even them. to do a pilot would require investment. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, if, if you look at um, structured problem solving, there has to be some financial uh, incentive, or some, not financial, some incentive for folks to relocate. Yeah. Okay. And last one, identify strategies that support recruitment and retention of culturally and distant diverse administrations in the district. Same thing. Right? Same thing, and I think that's part of that subgroup that's already put together that's working on it related to the minority. Um, uh, the chalkboard practice here, you want to work on that too. Yeah. Correct, and that's also part of the yeah. National I'm, Alliance work yeah. with yeah. So there's lots of initiatives that are working on the same oh, issue that we're trying to keep connected rather right. than just running parallel. And definitely that's an equity issue, both of those are yeah. equity issues, potential impact, yes, in those rural areas for sure. Yeah. Policy. Do we need policy? Um, it potentially could be depending upon what comes out of the work of the uh, subgroup. I'll just say maybe later, so we have to check. Right. All right. Thank you. We only have one minute over. We have okay. 29 minutes for OEAB and a chance to run get lunch. Thank you very much.